I think a lot of students have just gotten another sense of how to belong and how to create relationships outside of what were the traditional avenues. And a lot of my students talk about how they feel safe in the eSports program, and that's their family, that's their community. And I think that eSports gives kids a future that they might otherwise not have. Man, I wish that had been available when I was in high school. Welcome one and welcome all to the Virginia High School League Play Versus Championships. I'm your play-by-play -play audio adrenaline. Joining me on the desk is Key Oss, the one, the only, my wonderful color caster here for today. How are you feeling? I'm feeling pretty good. Had a great Rocket League series here. We're ready to go and excited for some more uh, video games. We're going to get League of Legends this time, so I'm excited. Absolutely. We just finished up watching the Rocket League. We had a 4-0 sweep. That was one hell of a series to watch. Now we're going to watch Parkview High School take off or take on Colonial Forge High School in the League of Legends finals. Yeah, we've seen a lot of dominance in League of Legends. Rocket League has been a bit more back and forth, but that one was just one-sided. <laughs> what, a, what a game by those guys. Really deserve that win. One goal away from the full sweep, but we're not here to talk about rocket-powered soccer. We're here to talk about League of Legends. And for those of you not entirely familiar with the scene, let's just give a brief overview of what the game is at its core. So basic 5v5 MOBA. MOBA uh, it's just a bunch of people running around trying to beat each other up here. There's also a lot of things on the map. In soccer, there's, you know, it's a clear field. There's nothing on it really except a few lines you got to worry about. But here we got structures you got to take down. Turrets, there's also dragons, there's Baron Nasher on the map, things that you can take down. These all give different buffs, gold, things that you can power up and allow you to take down the enemy team a bit faster. And also you want to get to that nexus on the uh, opposite side of the map that you spawn on, the enemy team's nexus, knock that down. That's how you end up ending the game. Yeah, well, we will see a map called Summoner's Rift. It's going to be split basically down the middle, going to be mirrored on either side. Both teams do have a base they have to try to defend to help them out. They have some turrets that will, you know, automatically target enemy champions that try to, you know, get too close. as a, hey, back off. And so we will see two of those five teams trying to destroy each other's base. Of course, there's a lot more nuances to that, and one of those being the characters that they can choose. Each player has a choice between over 140 different characters that they can choose to pilot into the game. And pretty soon here, we will be getting into what we call pick and ban phase. It's where both teams can draft the champions that they want to take into the game, as well as banning away picks that they don't want their enemies to grab. Yeah, there's a lot of champions in League of Legends. Not all of them are played consistently, but a large majority of them are. They can be picked up any time. We see a lot of unique picks this time as well. We see a lot of um, unique picks coming out because these guys maybe have a favorite champion or there's just a specific match they want to go for here. So we've seen some unique picks like the Volley Bear. I think I still think about that every day. I'm like, <laughs> oh, my God. That, that, he that was incredible. That and it bear. worked. It worked for him. Um, but, yeah, that's what we do call pocket picks. So champions that... One player just might be specifically good at a play style that they like to do, that they've homed, they developed. Another option is for these teams to go for what is meta. Uh, and by that, we mean what is generally accepted as the strongest champions in the game or the strongest way to play the game, the strongest strategy. And when we're looking at that right now in Season 10, it's all about that aggressiveness. It's all about getting those early leads to try to grab some early dragons, um, some early objective control, specifically around that bot lane is where we see the most aggression coming out. Some picks like the Misfortune, like the Senna, who does offer a little bit more utility, but still can be pretty oppressive in lane with the Glacial Augment builds. Um, and lots of playmaker supports like the Thresh, the Nautilus, the Leona. Yeah, so the bot lane has been very aggressive. Most of the map's been very aggressive, and the teams we've seen gone for more of a scaling strategy, wanting to play to the later game as opposed to just being go, go, go the entire time. They've really struggled when we've seen them, and it's kind of unfortunate because they pick that champion. They never really get to play them because right? the game's over before they really get to that point. And, of course, we have to give a huge thank you to our sponsors, Play Versus. We're putting this all together. Play Versus has been doing incredible work across the nation, setting up high school esports leagues for these students, rivaling the traditional sports of football, baseball, basketball, so on, really giving more kids opportunities to get involved into a competitive team environment that they like to play and that they are passionate about and really trying to hone that craft and potentially you know take it even further i mean the esports scene just as an industry has blown up completely over the last decade yeah and it, a lot of this competition requires so much teamwork so much communication between each other and you just talked about the things that change in the game too you got to stay on top of that there's yeah. so much you got to juggle here every two weeks or so they do have a little patch come through the developers will make small tweaks to the game uh it may be 
tuning down some damage on a champion that's a bit too strong, or maybe a champion isn't played at all. People think it's too weak, and so they'll, they'll maybe make it a little bit stronger. And so it can be the equivalent of, you know, if a professional basketball player, if they move the three-point line every other week, and he has to learn, you know, a, a new shooting spot. Um, so it's, it's really incredible the adaptability that these players have. But we are going to be getting into the draft phase here as we are going to see these two teams grabbing their rosters. Actually, taking a look at the bracket first, you're going to have the sections and the LCS fighting off in the champions. The section were able to take down the Wildcats and the PFHS Elite team while the SCL LCS went through Team Blue and League of Generals to get to the finals. If both these teams have had so much time to, to learn each other's tendencies, get together and, and sort of figure each other out. And now they're at the peak of their performance, right? They've Everything's been leading up to this. It's the finals here. Both teams comfortable with each other, but now they got to face off against a new opponent who they don't know too much about here. Maybe some scouting been done, but really not too much an opportunity to get a look at your opponent. So game one, maybe a little bit about feeling each other out, figuring out what's, what's going on here, and then you know, taking that into games two and three and uh, trying to adapt to the opponents as well, because you can't just deal with the champions. You got to adapt to the opponent. And this is a best of three, as you mentioned. I like that you brought that up because adaptability is so important with the small amount of games. Now you have a game like Rocket League, best of seven. If you fall down early in the first two, one or two games, there's plenty of time for you to come back. In League of Legends, there is only three games. And with the long, drawn-out nature of the games, the game could more or less be decided by 15 minutes into the game. Yeah, sometimes in League of Legends, you do have a game that's somewhat decided in an early stage, right? And then there's just less and less chance for you to come back. And that can be kind of demoralizing uh, for you. And, and the mental you know, strength it takes to come back from that is, is quite tough. And that's why I've seen a lot of best of threes just go down in two games because one team gets ahead and it's really, really tough to come back from mentally. But also, once you lose that first game, all of a sudden you're kind of like in a, in a bit of a tough spot because you have to ban away those champions that were super good in game one. And now you got to deal with that. So it takes a little bit to adapt to that. And that's why I think we've seen so many you know best of threes only go two games. And that is a really strong strategy that we've seen come out from these teams is after game one if there's something that the enemy performed really well on just ban it away for game two yeah that's definitely the best strategy to go with usually because you just can't find a counter instantly to things like that well let's take a little bit of a, a peek behind the window of what we might see in this draft phase so we've kind of seen a mixed bag of pocket picks and meta picks uh we can't really predict the pocket picks obviously you know not having direct insight into what these players haven't practicing in their scrims in their solo queue at home but as far as meta picks, what could we expect from this draft phase? Well, as you alluded to earlier in the bot lane, the meta is a little bit set and set right now. It's like usually MF Aphelios, a little bit of Jin here and there, but she's not he's not too common. Same thing with Caitlyn, we're here and there. But those are the big 80 carries right now. And then you also have in the, in the support position, you got Leona, Braum, a little bit of Tom Kench to sometimes counter those aggressive supports here. And then sometimes you'll see the Nalus as well, especially paired with things like Kaisa, who has great synergy with him. And speaking of set, the newest champion to join Summoner's Rift will be available during this series. So we may see the top laner, uh, or if they wanted to flex that around. I have seen him play a little bit in jungle, a little bit of mid lane, if they want to pick him up. I think he's a very strong champion currently in the meta. He has a lot of stats under his belt. A little bit low on the mobility and the engage side, so definitely looking to get an advantage in lane in the early game if you want to pick up set. Later on, you have to get a bit more creative with your engages. I kind of akin him to a Lee Sin in that regard, where you can set up these amazing plays where you get into the back line, you, you know, pick out a carry, you bring him into your team, but also, you know, there's there's a lot of those failed plays as well as where you just, you know, bring somebody the wrong direction or you just jump in, not able to find the angle, you just get blown up. Definitely a, a tricky champion to pilot. He is a little bit simpler in terms of base things than some of the other champions that released. Um, you know, recently, but there's a lot of depth that can, especially the ultimate is a little tricky sometimes, but also managing how much damage you take so you can get a bigger shield a as that damage comes in. So he's a bit more complex than just like his abilities really look at the start thing. That's kind of think like Jax a little bit where it's like his abilities are pretty simple. There, There's not too comp not too much complication there, but what it really comes down is the way it interacts with the other champions in the game here. So yeah, set I think can be sometimes flexed to mid lane as well, especially like Renekton sometimes has played in mid lane. Mm -hmm. Darius for a little while for was played mid lane as well, specifically to sort of get matchups, especially against those melee assassins. So we might see set if there is in a Collier or Diana pick. I think that might be a good matchup. I haven't seen it too much, but perhaps that's one of the counters people are looking for. Set does fare pretty poorly against ranged champions. Uh, sure. So I like that you mentioned the melee matchups there. 
you pretty much never want to pick it blind because any ranged matchup is just going to demolish him. He doesn't really have any gap closers outside of a small movement speed boost on his Q. But when you're going to those melee matchups, just having the pressure of that E being able to draw you in, just stand between the champion and the minion wave can be so oppressive. Do you expect us to see him played at all today? I think only if the matchup works out for sure. I think you, like you said, can't pick a blind. You have to be very, very sure of what's going in the top side. And with a lot of the champions now being able to flex between the two soul lanes and mid and top lane, it's kind of tricky to figure out what's going there because they could pick something like, oh, well, it's obviously a mid lane pick. Well, it's fine to pick set here. They'll, they'll probably not go for range top lane or two, but all of a sudden they do where they swap that mid lane champion. So you got to be very, very careful of when you pick that set and make sure that he's got that correct match in the top side. Otherwise, that can be a real issue to deal with. It absolutely can. And Let's talk a little bit about the jungle as well, because jungle, the biggest role that has changed in the, this new season, we've seen the rise of the elements. There's been a lot of high priority on those. So as we get into this draft phase, tell me about some of the junglers we might see. So uh, recently, it's like you said, it's all been an early game, getting that early pressure. So Olaf, great first pick as well, because there's not really a ton of counters to him. Lee, Lee Sin, and then you've seen a few other junglers, but those have been I mean, to me, the big three, but there's obviously been a few others, but it's all about getting that early game pressure. It's just like, we need to be on the map. Rek'Sai, another good one here, who can also dive pretty well. Um, dropping the aggro at level six from the turret is huge, so those are some of the big junglers, but they're all about being early game. The scaling junglers have not worked out like a lot of scaling laners as well. PvP at level three is the big tagline for junglers mm -hmm. this season. You want a power farm to that level three and then gank as much as you can because with the removal of catch up xp if you start to fall behind your opponent you you can't just farm to catch back up it's not going to be enough and so ganking 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 this time we're not going to be seeing set at least here in game one it's going to be banned away by colonial forge both teams right now going to have three bands to take away the champions so far park view going to target the yaspo the caitlin and the annie definitely feel like some pocket picks for me. We've seen a lot of Annie bands, actually, as Colonial Forge is going to answer with the Darius, the Set, and the Jax. Yeah, when you look at the names of some of these players as well, it's very clear that they have a favorite champion. Those have been taken away here. The Darius for Hemorrhage. You also have uh, Yasuo um, for the enemy mid laner on Colonial Forge here, and then you also have Yorick being played at the top lane. Maybe we'll get to see the Yorick. He's named himself after that champion. Perhaps we'll get to see that. But we get a Kha'Zix first pick, a pretty surprising one. He's a pretty good jungler um, when you can get to uh, a lead early on because he can just kind of one-shot people. It's like, well, all of a sudden damage out of nowhere. So if he can get ahead, get the, uh, those 80 items, he can be really, really a pain. But big things that shut him down, CC in the back line. Leona's a great counter to the Kha'Zix if he jumps in on your AD carry. The Mordekaiser as well, just sending you to that death realm. This is a very strong first couple of picks here by Colonial Forge. You see Parkview grabbing the Jin for themselves as well. Going to be locking in a support here. Or actually, the Garen up in the top side. So definitely feels like a you know personal pick versus meta picks here. Parkview going with what they're comfortable with. We don't see a lot of these champions right now when we're looking at professional play. But still, very strong champions in their own right if you can play them effectively. Garen is really where I have some question marks because when we look at Garen going up against the Mordekaiser, it just feels like Garen doesn't have a whole lot he can offer if he doesn't win that 1v1. The the big thing he can do is silence um, in a team fight if he can get onto the back line. So silencing the Lucian could be big because if Lucian doesn't have his dash up or his abilities, then he's really quite weak because Lucian is so reliant on getting his passive off with a double auto after he uses an ability plus um, the culling is a huge uh, a team fight ultimate too. If you can find the like the max damage on it, as well as just be able to get away with relentless pursuit or get you know pursue them with right. it, that that is big too. So silencing the Lucian could be big, but you're right. The Garen does have a little bit of, of problems in this team comp for sure. But he can just be good if he does get ahead, win that one v one, or just be a just be a tank. Me be, be meatball in the front line to soak up some damage here. So the Garen can work out here, but the Jin and Kha'Zix definitely need to have things go their way. Otherwise, they can become a bit of a liability. Speaking of that meatball, the Zat going to come through the first pick in the second rotation for Colonial Forge. Lots of long range engage can be very difficult to ward against. Has so many creative ganking paths with the extended rage he has on that slingshot. Answered back by the rise in the Blitzcrank. So interesting picks there a little bit of uh safety scaling and a very strong playmaker for park view is colonial forge their last pick is going to be that aurelia yeah i i love to see a blitzcrank don't get me wrong i love, I love to see love the, the, the champion the hook master 
but I'm worried here because who do you really want to hook? The only person I can see is Lucian. Every other champion, they kind of want to be in your team. So, like, if you hook the Aurelia, I guess she's an okay target. But if you hook the Mordekaiser, the Zac, the, you know, the Leona, like, those champions want to be in your backline. They want to be there to CC the enemy team or just do damage. Mordekaiser is going to smack you. So, I'm a little worried that Blitzcrank's not going to be able to find the right target or he'll find the wrong one and pull the, you know, the Zac and all of a sudden, oh, Zac's like, all right, let's bounce, do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. And then that's a real problem. So, the Blitzcrank has his hands full because there's going to be the bodyguard just sitting in front of that that Lucian, which he really wants to get to. And obviously, Lucian has his dash. He can, you know, um, dodge that rocket crap. So hopefully, the Blitzcrank can work out. But he's got to be really, really good with the hooks today. Um, and Rise falling a little bit of popularity, but a great champion. I think he's a great pickup here, and also good in the enemy team. I think he's really good here. He can kite the melee threats uh, pretty well. So I think that the Rise is a great pickup at the end of this draft here. Um, but. Parkview, uh, interesting bot lane pick. Uh, we'll see if this works out, but this is a big gamble with the with the Jin Blitzcrank. Yeah, I think it's definitely going to come down to uh, lanes here for Parkview. They really want to get an advantage in the individual 1v1s because when I'm looking at come mid-game, these first Rift Heralds start spawning, first Dragons start spawning, and especially once level 6s come through, I look at the massive ultimates coming in from Colonial Forge, the Death Realm, the ultimate from Leona, the Colleen, the Let's Bounce, the ultimate from Aurelia. Like, there's so much team uh, fight potential there, whereas on Parkview, it's it's a lot more utility. I mean, you've got a Silence plus Shield Breaker on Blitzcrank. The AoE Silence is definitely nice. Um, Rise is a little bit more utility. Garen can really focus at one target if it gets low. Uh, you know, Jin. Not going to be looking to put out a whole lot of DPS. Again, it's more pick potential here for Parkview. So they want to get an advantage early, and they want to uh, transition that lead into the mid game where they can control vision, isolate targets, and then pick them off. Never give Colonial Forge that 5v5. The, the one thing I do think that works out in Parkview's favor is actually the meta is pretty quick. So the way they've drafted here, they definitely want to be aggressive and look for the picks early on, and, you know, especially in the mid game, they'll be really, really strong. Whereas on the other side, the Zac takes a little bit to scale up. Aurelia needs that Triforce and maybe another item to really get going here. Lucian scales pretty well and is decent in the early game, but he's low range. And he has to kind of walk in the enemy team to get, get that damage done. So I think Parkview is actually kind of in a decent spot in terms of the fact that they have the enemy team has very low range. They kind of got, got to get in there to really get things done. And if you also look at the um, way that the game's going to play out, there, we haven't really gotten to team fight situation. True 5v5s oh, in a lot of Hang on there. This is not where you want to be, Kaza. It gets stunned up by the flawless duet. Has to flash the wall. Blast cone coming in. Immediate heal there from Namor to try to keep his jungler alive. And Nate Pond will escape with his life. Just burning that flash. Heal down two. Yeah, the, the, the big problem losing the summer falls, obviously. But also he's going to start that jungle late here. He won't get to his buff early on. He probably won't get a leash either. So the cause is going to be significantly behind. Zach doesn't farm too fast. Um, he's pretty good at farming overall. But compared to a lot of junglers, he's not like super, super quick. Um, and he does get pretty low. So it's not like the Zach will punish him with an invade or anything. But it does set the, the, the Kha'Zix behind. That's definitely a concern here. But... Kha'Zix's well, pretty good at clearing the jungle. He'll be fine. It's just you can't really look for ganks too early on. And that's where I actually like the look from Nate Pawn to try to get aggressive, steal that blue away from the Zac. He was going in for a ward there. It was a very unusual spot for all five members to stack in that bush. Um, but if you can punish that Zac early and set him behind, he does have a very weak early clear. And so you can really delay a lot of his early spikes. Make sure he doesn't get that bombing cinder early on. Really slows down how quickly he can clear the jungle. Um, so I like the aggressive look. Just y you can't face check into that bush alone as a Kha'Zix. No, you you really need some backup there. And he went a little bit too far. But everything's stabilized here. No no um no first takedown. So we're all good here. It's it's not anything bad just yet. And uh, the lane's pretty stable. So not really that bad of a news here. Game one. I think it. Losing, you know, losing that Kha'Zix early on could have been pretty disastrous, but not losing him, he's just a little slow in the jungle, not the end of the world. Now, though, down in this bottom lane, we do see Namor without the heal, so that is a summoner a spell advantage for Sahori and Leona. They're going to be able to get aggressive here, and if they try to take a 2v2, as long as there isn't any jungle intervention, you, you got to give them the edge. Certainly, I think in the early game, that's very, very true here. And, uh, 
I think the, the rest of the lanes are relatively even for the most part, but bot lane I think I would definitely you know give over. So that's definitely a concern there. We've talked about how how important bottom lane is, especially with these dragons. It's a cloud drake first. Um, may be good for both teams to pick that up. I think it synergizes pretty well with pretty much everyone. A lot of really big ultimates uh, with pretty long cooldowns. Right now, both junglers in the top side of the map, though, so not near that objective at the moment. We'll see if they decide to go for any ganks in the top side. We see the wave around the midpoint. Already some ping is coming down from the Zac. Colonial Forge looking to maybe make something happen. Zac having that long range engage. Should only have one point in the last six slingshots, so we can't engage from you know, the, the massive ranges that we're used to seeing, but could still find something cheeky to happen. Meanwhile, Nate Pond is looking to grab that Scuttle Crab. The, the wave has come into him here, so he doesn't, he doesn't need that extra range on the last six shot. He'll be able to get in there if he wants to. But the Kha'Zix is actually slightly up in farm now because the Zac has sat here so long. So that's good news. Ooh, Hemorrhage, though, may have caught himself in a little bit of trouble. Just going to spin to win to try to escape. And there's no CC left. So, so the minion blocked the last, the last the, the, uh, stretching strike there. That is actually a massive advantage, though, for Parkview. With the Zac spending so much time in that top lane, you saw Kha'Zix run straight through the mid lane to get to the second scuttle. He realized that Zac was on the top side, uh, or was most likely on the top side from having information where he started. So grabbing that top scuttle, going straight down to get that second one down here on the bot side. Namor has no heal, but right now it is Sahori that is in danger. Here comes that Kha'Zix looking for that isolated damage. No flash though to follow, that is crucial. And now Colonial is trying to turn it around. Here comes a teleport from Yorick. The uh, first takedown gonna go over to Sahori on the Lucian as the second one will fall not too long after Yorick gonna grab that one. Yeah, and that was kind of unfortunate because the Garen took Ignite. He didn't have the TP to match here. They have TP in the mid lane, but because the Aureli was around, the Rise couldn't TP in, so there was no way to match that and make it even fight. And they were so far down the lane, it was really hard to run away. So pretty disastrous first gank there. But the TP is down now, and the Dragon's up. If the Kha'Zix is able to get to level 6 pretty quickly, if he evolves the Q first, he can solo the Dragon really quite easily. That is a very good benefit to the Kha'Zix, having that isolated Dragon. Very good at taking those, but... Mm -hmm. That was such a close gank by Parkview. I actually liked the look, but the fact that Napon didn't have Flash, he couldn't follow up on that Lucian, and so they just chased a little bit too far. I think after you blow that Flash, that's where you have to call it off. Say, hey, we don't have the Summoner spells to, to follow. Speaking of Flash, gonna be burned there in the mid lane as the Rise is gonna get a little bit of chip damage back onto the Zac. Nice, good sh stretching strikes there, be able to pressure that Rise. The Rise now uh, sands Flash, but he did bring three members down there, so I think kind of worth for him. He's definitely looking at a back end um, because he's just so low on mana. Even though he's, he's already gotten that tier, he still has the TP, so I think he's definitely looking to get a back end, refill the mana, and potentially get, you know, like a Dark Seal or some other items to try and get through this laning phase here. Because the, the Aurelia does actually have really good base wave clear for, mo for a melee champion especially. So I think this is actually like a decent spot for the Rise to be in with still um, TP up here. Because I don't think they really need it for anything else. Because um, there's not really like, going to be a global play most likely, I don't think, in the next couple minutes. Yeah, being able to get that tier and save the teleport to come back to lane is actually so nice. A lot of Rises will get the money for the tier and then immediately pull off, you know, a less than optimal recall just because they have that teleport and get back to lane. But keeping that teleport advantage, good, very important for that Rise. Up here in the top side, we actually see, although York has been the one pressuring this Garen in, Probably partly due to the teleport down to the bot side, a massive CS differential building for that Garen. That's that's really good news for sure. As you talked about, if the Garen falls behind the 1v1, becomes a lot, a lot less useful because he is so reliant on damage. He doesn't have that just hard CC to be useful all the time. So this is actually very good news for them. And you saw the Kha'Zix come mid lane and just it looked like he was stealing the farm of the Rise there and just kind of messing up. What he was doing there was just shoving in the waves of the Rise to get back because the Rise is reliant on mana for his abilities to actually shove in the wave. And if the Kha'Zix didn't come, then the Aurelia would just freeze the wave and then be very hard for the Rise to back because he would lose a lot of gold and experience by going back and losing all those minions. So it was actually like weird, but that's what the Kha'Zix is doing. He's actually helping his teammate there. Yeah, once again, Cat Take Steel is going to be holding on to that teleport, potentially looking to answer a play around the map. Right now, it's a K is in the bottom side. 
couple points into that elastic slingshot means now you really have to be careful about where you ward. Any dark corner, you can see already double control ward down there on that bottom side, putting that one behind to make sure that nobody slips in a ward that's going to spot out a long range that can gauge. Yeah, that's definitely good to have down here. With the way the wards are now, they just don't, you don't have as many basically. It's so hard to keep everything warded. So it's, it's better, it's a little better for junglers, I think, in general, because there's a little bit less vision, especially early on in the game before you can get control wards. So I think it's good for junglers overall, but having that laner put down a control ward makes it even that much harder to keep wards somewhere. And with a champion like Zach and Gank with so many different angles, it's really hard to keep them. Oh, here comes the on ultimate you. by Aurelia. Ignite going down. Stretching Strike's not going to be close enough. He doesn't even need it. Yasuo going to find a solo takedown in the middle lane. Really well done there. And that's the difference between Ignite and, and TP. Like, we haven't seen it in top lane go down where the Garen is being able to take a positive trade because of the Ignite. But when you do get in those all-in situations, the Ignite plays such a pivotal role in that because the, the small healing that Ryze does have doesn't really come into play as much. And you also just have so much more damage from that Ignite. Speaking of this top lane, the gap is slowly closing here for Yorick. Able to continually just Badger the Garen under his turret. Right now, Zach is being caught trying to steal away the red buff. Has his team waiting just around the corner though. Here comes Leona with the Zenith Blade. There comes the stun. Elastic slingshot. The CC was chained immaculately, and it is going to be Colonial Forge picking up another takedown. Well, it's priority t rotations from everywhere. The Leona comes up from bot lane. Blitzcrank isn't there. Top lane, you have the the priority from Mordecai's or mid lane, same thing with the Aurelia. Everywhere, Colonial was ahead of the enemy, so they got there faster. And even though the Zac was actually losing the 1v1, it didn't matter because his teammates were there to back him up. That's when you know you can invade as a jungler. Teammates were there, they win. See a 1v1 here on the bottom side, the flash forward, but the flash away. Sahori able to outplay the 1v2. Now looking to get aggressive onto the Blitzcrank. Really good offensive look there by Colonial recognizing he had that moment where he was isolated. Lucian, such a strong 1v1 champ, makes full use of it. Well, and this is, is kind of interesting because this has been one of the closest early games you've had um, in all the games these past Which week. is weird to say because it's five takedowns exactly. to zero. Exactly, and that's what I'm saying is they're just starting now to like pull away. Colonial's starting to show that they've got a lead and they're going to continue to push it. But it's it's weird because this game is a little lopsided, but it's probably one of the most even we have. But now maybe Colonial's going to change that and we're going to see a lopsided game here because they're starting to come out to a big lead here at only 10 minutes. Wave going to be crashed here by the rise. You're looking to grab it back. Seeing those recalls completed, now you're going to see Parkview move towards that dragon that Kha'Zix, you said, can take it extremely quickly. They don't have information on where the Zac is right now, but they have a pretty good guess after seeing the mid laner recall. Yeah, for sure. They, they're pretty sure he went back here. So it you know, opens up the Kha'Zix to go in and take the dragon here. Kha'Zix also... Um, pretty good smite secure as we think about like champions like Nunu who have really good burst abilities. Kha'Zix with his Evolve Q especially has really good burst damage here and he can have it on such a sh short cooldown with that Evolve Q. So it's really big to have that that powerful you know dragon or just objective secure with the smite and the oh, look burst at this. damage. Yorick sentencing hemorrhage to the death realm. A couple more auto attacks will do it. Now in a takedown spree for himself. That Garen not quite working out how part of you thought it would. Yeah, that's quite unfortunate here because, again, the, the Garen was playing so much for the 1v1. Ooh, flash forward, Zenith played in, but here's the jungler looking to turn this around. Sahori is still able to find a takedown on a spree. Immediately shut down by Napon, though. And now the Leona in a 1v2. Can she find another counter? Oh, man, on the that's Kha'Zix. a lot of CC. The flash away from Napon to keep himself safe. Meanwhile, though, Colonial is just wrecking the top lane turret as they're now looking for a dive onto the rise. That's a lot of damage coming through, though. One more turret shot will take Yorick down. I believe that one's going to go through. Shut down for Cat Takes Skill. Now looking to try to turn around on the Zac as well. Elastic Slingshots get back to the safety of the turret, pick up that gold, and still makes it out alive. Very impressive play there by the Rise to outplay that 2v1 situation. Loses the turret still, but hey, he did a great job surviving and shuts down that Mordekaiser, which is pretty big. And so important for Parkview to make that stop up there on the top side because uh, con or investing resources into the bottom lane, trying to get that 3v2, but still trading a takedown over and having to blow your jungler's flash. If they had also lost the play on the top side, that would just be disastrous for them. They would probably have... You know, definitely lost that turret. Might have even gotten Shelly off to a second charge and taken a second turret. So, 
amazing, you know, just all the props the cat takes to kill there. Yeah, the Kha'Zix actually ran out of mana in that gank, and Bromero also um, knocked up a minion instead of the enemy to <laughs> carry, which is a problem. Um, so good outplay there by the enemy bot lane. Colonial's bot lane done a great job this game here. Leona's done a great job roaming, but also in the 2v2, they've been really quite something here. The CS lead isn't massive, but you can see the, sc the score right now, 0-2 versus 3-1 You know, in the AD carry department. Pretty big difference there. And you can see the completed item versus just parts on the other side. So Lucian up quite a bit here. Another two minutes for the Dragon, but I think we might um, see that one go over to the other side if Colonial do play around it a bit more than the last one where they just kind of gave it up because they were backing. And I love seeing this from Takei. He's constantly just sitting in lane, just sitting in these side brushes, waiting for any moment when the laners might show up, and it can really take a toll on a laner's mental. When you, you keep getting ganked by these Zacks that's just walking through lane, you now have to think, if you don't have a ward in that bush, well, he could potentially be there. It allows you to have pressure all over the map. Right now, we might see a 3v3 coming in, though. Leona is hooked in again. That's not who you want to bring in. She's going to go golden. Buy herself a little bit of time. Less bounce is creating some disruption. York has the first takedown. The Zac is still alive. A double takedown for the Mordenkaiser. And that is going to be a quick 2-0 for Colonial Forge. And they're going to take a tower off the back. Well, the mini wave is going down here, but they're continuing the play. Heal there by Sahori to try to close the distance. Is going to be stunned up there by the Jin. Now opening up with the curtain call. Trying to find a couple takedowns here. Everyone just going to stand behind the big, beefy meatball, though, and find their recalls. Crucially, though, Jin was able to push them off the turret. It does save the turret, and that's really big here because losing another outer would really push them back and make it really hard to even just have, have an even sort of setup in, on the map because right now they're just completely losing control of the river, and losing this, this mid lane outer does the same thing where you just continue to just lose control of the map and eventually lose control of your own jungle, and that's a lot of um, golden XP to lose, so definitely concerning that the turrets are starting to fall here at 15 minutes. It means it's really much, a lot harder to continue to sort of main farm and experience parity. Uh, but Garen gets one back, and you're not the end of the world for Parkview. But Colonial is starting to eke out um, slightly more of a lead, although it hasn't grown at, at the rate we've seen it, you know, typically in these games here. Parkview's done a good job sort of stemming the bleeding. We can see Hemorrhage going for that Triforce build, actually. Uh, going to allow him to have a lot more 1v1 potential with the bonus, you know, damage from the Sheen, as well as the attack speed now scaling into the E. Um, but it's going to mean he's going to be even worse in team fights. So they're really honing in on this 1-3-1 one, one style, knowing that they can't win the straight up 5v5 and just to just itemizing completely against it. Well, one of the worst things that a split push comp can experience is losing the map early on because then you can't actually execute the strength of your composition, which is to spread out the map and to pressure multiple sides here. So losing the second outer turret here and the mid lane outer turret being very low is certainly very worrisome considering here they're going to the Realm Warp though behind Colonial Forge. Lucian oh, wow. going to flash away. A beautiful ultimate by Leona is going to buy her ADC enough time to escape. But it's still going to be one takedown going back over to Parkview. Well, I mean, that was a great play on the map with the Realm Warp, but a fantastic Solar Flare by Leona. I mean, if she doesn't hit that, that's her AD carry doesn't make it back to base. So um, that was a really nice play. They're going to lose the Dragon because of this map play here, so I really like how Parkview has played this one. Using the Realm Warp, the strength of their team, and, and using that to sort of split up the enemy team. Because like we said, they're not really great in grouped up fights with a lot of people, and they're also behind a little bit here. So they're using the strength of the Realm Warp, the map, to really get an advantage that way. And now they've got two dragons, which if they can continue to get these dragons here, despite being a little bit behind, that's big news because then they can potentially leverage that as an alternate wing addition, get themselves back into this game, which, you know, they're not too far down, but they are definitely behind. Jin, one of those champions that benefits more than almost anybody else with stacking Infernal Dragons, with the way that his passive works and giving him extra AD. Um, but also, it's going to be true for a Rift Herald up on the top side. You see Zach picking that one up. I'm interested to see what Colonial Forge will actually do with that because a big strategy right now is just let those first first two drakes go. The individual drakes aren't that effective. It's hang on, Daddy Asso here in the bottom side uses the ultimate to try to buy some space with teleports coming in. Nowhere else to go. And he thought he was making a play, but he was the one getting played as he falls there. Well, this is really encouraging because Parkview are doing exactly what you need to do when you play from behind. You don't take even fights, okay? Because if you take even fights, you're just going to lose them because you're behind. 
but they've done a fantastic job of just finding caught out members from Colonial. And that's partially Colonial's mistake. They're, they're sending people a little bit too far forward when they really shouldn't. But Parkview are doing such a good job of punishing the enemy team's mistakes here. A lot of times when people get behind, they just try and like turtle up. And sometimes that's the right strategy, especially if you have a good wave clear. But right now, Parkview has mediocre wave clear. They can't really defend and just sit and rely on scaling. That's not really, that's not really the strength of their composition. So they're saying, all right, we'll, we'll use the Realm Warp, we'll use the TPs, the things that we have that we know are good and can be used to exploit the enemy team's mistakes, use those, get ourselves back in that way, as opposed to just sitting here and slowly losing. And it's really refreshing because we don't often see those globals being used very effectively. Utility can be so strong, and they have tons of it, uh, but it is much harder to execute. you got to think that the group up is five and just death ball to win composition of Colonial Forge is so much easier to pull off. So I 100% agree. It is such a relief to see that part you are using the tools that they have effectively. Now, getting close to evening this one up, there is still a 4,000 gold lead for the side of Colonial. It's a nice hook away of the red buff. Gives it over to Namor exactly where you want that buff to be. But these next couple dragons are going to be really big for this game. Because as I was mentioning earlier, a lot of teams, they just sacrifice the first two early drakes. Individually, drakes don't give that much bonuses. Where I think we're talking like 4% armor magic resist in the mountain dragon, 10% CDR. It's okay to give those up as long as with the third and fourth dragon, you really start contesting. I think that has been the mentality Colonial has gone with, as they just say, well, we'll give them up. They're not important. What's more important is to play the map, try and find... Uh, advantages elsewhere, push the pace of the game, get turrets. Like a five one Mordekaiser. And now, you, exactly, you have a five one Mordekaiser <laughs> because they played that way. Obviously, even though the dragon's not great, but it's like you said, it's not a big deal here. So as long as they can secure the next ones, it's fine. But if Parkview managed to find a pick just before that Baron spawns, or the rather the dragon spawns, the Baron's about to spawn too. But before the dragon spawns here, because I don't think anyone's going to attempt Baron right now. Then I think they this might be a, w a huge way for them to you know try and win, especially later on in the game, because um, Colonial like giving over those infernal drakes. Like if you get one or two, Jin is going to become such a monstrosity in the later game that they don't really have anyone can deal with them. They have tanky champions, but they don't really have a true tank besides the Zac. But that's not really enough to keep the Jin at bay if he's that strong. Yeah, that's going to be a very dangerous thing. A couple of back timers coming through here. Shelly going to walk up and get that charge. I'm actually surprised that one got let go. It's Parkview not defending there. But now, 20 minutes into the game, let's start to talk about those third and fourth dragons as they spawn his name more. He might want a piece of Yasuo. Has the ultimate available. The minion block, though. If he had gotten <laughs> that fourth shot, you know he would have gone for it. Right now, though, Yorick might be looking to find a fight. The silence there interrupting the E. Zach waiting just across the wall. But if we get to a scenario where these infernal dragons are on the field, and, you know, 4,000 gold advantage for Colonial. Do Parkview take that fighter on the Drake? Do they go for that third and that fourth Drake, knowing they are down in gold, going into a 5v5? Well, like I said, I think that you can't really take a fight, per se, but well, they can maybe find on. a pick Zach up. getting knocked up by the Let's Bounce. Hammer just going to be running back to the safety of his well, turret. This York, is maybe a mistake. They're going to the Drake. The ultimate going to go through, and actually, Hemorrhage was able to find the shutdown. That is massive. Like you said, the jungler investing time up there. Infernal Dragon about to spawn. And Hemorrhage able to pull off the hero 1v2. That is the power of the execution coming through from that ultimate. And now it is part view with control dragon. over this dragon. This is massive because there's pretty much no way into this pit, I think. In a, in a true 5v4, I think they do win. Although, hold on, Hemorrhage is actually too far on the top side. So this will be a 4v4 if no he does go for it. Yeah, he's got to it, it's keep it down so fast. <laughs> But they get it before it matters, so that was huge. The 2v1 on the top side is massive because then they can't contest the dragon, no TP, which, you know, the Mordekaiser had. He can't TP if he's not alive, so that's good. Uh, so this is really big because part of you now have... If you could. That would be scary. <laughs> that would be scary. If any champion could do it, Mordekaiser would, but... Parkview now with a Jin who's going to be on his second item soon here. He's got already one Infernal, and they just keep losing these dragons. Like, one or two is fine, but now they've lost the third, and potentially, you know, if the same mistake is made, the fourth, that gets really, really scary, and then you start looking at the, you know, Infernal Soul. That's a devastating soul to get, so I am actually kind of worried here. Colonial are ahead, but this game kind of feels like Parkview might be in control of it based on the way the last couple of minutes have gone. Yeah, they did a really good job at 
cutting their losses, playing to where they are strong in the map, and just showing up their weaknesses. That Garen, remember, fell f so far behind early. The great teleport play by the Mordekaiser, able to grab him a couple of early takedowns, snowballed that into the lead, but Hemorrhage kept his cool. He stayed farming in the top side. He's now on a you know almost 40 CS advantage and got back up to that point where he has the Triforce. He's building for that 1v1 against the Mordekaiser and was able to find that takedown completely flipping this game in the tech. I think you kind of hit the nail on the head there. It was They kept cool. They, they stayed patient. A lot of times when you get behind, there's basically two reactions I've found um, for the most part when teams are behind us. We might see another play, although Hemmer seems to like want to run away here. So there's some Vision Wars being put down as we move our attention towards Baron here. But teams either, they get impatient, just try and force plays which, you know, isn't good because then you just get destroyed because you're so far behind. Or they just don't do anything. It's kind of one of those two That's extremes almost worse. <laughs> That's almost worse in some ways, um, you know, depending on your composition. Sometimes if you have a super scaler, it's okay, but for the most part, it's not good. But sometimes, you know, you get that little middle ground here where they're patient, but they find their opportunities. They find those little openings. There are not too many of them, but Parkview have done a great job of finding them, and that's what's gotten them back in this game. That's what's gotten Garen specifically back in this game. Hemorrhage has done such a good job of that, and now he's up in that matchup, despite being down four. But, you know, it's, it's he's 1-1, one, one, the Mordecai's just 5-2. and two. Like, that's such a big difference, but the farm and, and the way he's played this game with his patience has been so great, and it's allowed Parkview to stay in this game, which... Every other series we've seen, 4,000 gold to 10 minutes, or 3,000, I think it was, game's over. But Park, you've done such a good job playing from behind here, being patient, and finding the opportunities that they're actually in this game here, and maybe, you know, with the Dragons they picked up, very close in gold, if not ahead, effectively. Yeah, and they have a lot of really great scaling. Look at that rise. Upgraded Seraph's Embrace, now fully stacked Rod of Ages. That is a scary rise to go up against, and... The, the gym having the two completed items, the Infinity Edge on deck, with one Infernal Dragon already in his pocket, one more make it even more of a monster. And we've got that Triforce Garen that's going for a little bit of a later game build. Some answers coming through from Colonial Forge. You do see Lucian as well going for that full crit build, has the IE Essence Reaver plus Zeal. So he's going to be dishing out a lot of damage in these team fights, specifically to some of the squishier carries. But I, I, I don't know. Coming into. Th these 5v5s, do you still even give the edge over to Colonial Forge? I'd say it's relatively even now. I think it just comes down to execution. No one really has a massive advantage here because the, the item times in Parkview are spot on at this stage in the game here. They're at a really good spot right now. The Kha'Zix isn't as useful as the Zac at the moment because he just hasn't been able to snowball lead and get you know too much damage together. But he does still threaten the Lucian. So I think Colonial have some strengths in their team fight, and it's a little bit easier to execute. However, because of the way things have gone in the last couple of minutes, I think Parkview are, are just as good in a team fight right now because of the way they've been playing and just the way their items have lined up here. So I think team fights are pretty even at this stage in the game. But I think Parkview should continue to play to their strengths here, not opt into a 5v5 if they don't have to. I think they should continue to spread the map here. Realm Warp is such a powerful ability. And uh, they're setting up for another dragon here. But now with Baron up, it's a little tricky. If they do commit to the dragon, that could open up a Baron for Colonial. So Parkview have to be careful. Would you take that trade, though? Infernal Soul coming in. Such a powerful buff. More importantly, a permanent buff. So if you yeah, do decide to want to trade decision. that Infernal Soul for the Baron, that's only about three minutes that you have to weather the storm of that Baron. After that point, as long as you don't lose like an inhibitor, and there's still a lot of turrets left to go through, I think if you're part for you take that trade 10 times out of 10. I agree because they still have the inners. If they only had their base left, I would say Baron's too then, risky. Then it gets a little bit risky. But because they have inners, I think the trade, but it looks like they don't want to trade. Colonial yeah. want to take the dragon here. So we're not going to see a trade. We're going to see a fight most likely. I think Colonial Forge recognize that. They say, hey, we don't have a lot of siege potential other than like the Leona. Um, and this is the soul. So this is yeah. where you have to fight. So they've tried to get control here. They have Yasuo, oh, a little bit slipped from the side. He doesn't have Realm any enemies around him. Realm Warp, a really good pincer Beautiful. move there from Parkview. And now here comes the 5v5. Namor caught out of position. He goes down at the beginning of the fight. Double takedown already for the York has locked the Garen in the Death Realm. And this fight, it started off Parkview, but it is ending with Colonial Forge. A triple takedown, three for zero. The ace coming through.
I mean, that was a beautiful start to the fight with Park U. Exactly how they had to do it. They found the Aureli on the side. They roam up behind her. She, no escape for her. Even if she had been able to flash over that wall, which is too thick to do, there's just no way she gets away. Beautifully done, and then everything falls apart after. They go back into the river here, and their AD carry face checks the brush. He gets taken down, and after that, there was no way you know Parkview was going to win. Colonial punished them after just walking carelessly back in the river. They did everything right, and then they just threw it all away. Yeah, it seems like Namor just kind of got wrapped up in the excitement of, hey, we, we, we won, we picked him off, we're going to get the dragon yeah. now, and he's rushing towards it, and he forget, oh, wait. There's the a whole rest team there. of the team <laughs> is there. Face Jacks gets taken down, blows both his summoners as well. That that definitely feels bad. Mm -hmm. But Yorick coming up huge, able to find a double takedown before he even brings the Garen into the the Death Realm. So absolutely massive in not only taking down some of the key carries, but then isolating the front line. And that was a huge fight from the Mordekaiser for sure. And the rest of the team put out the damage they needed to. And the Mordekaiser was just sitting in the front line like the juggernaut he is, just smacking people around. And then he got rid of the Garen, who, at the end of the fight, he can actually do some massive damage, especially with the Conqueror stacked up and you know getting through all his health and that gets the damage from the Triforce. Garen can be very, very scary at clean up at, at the end of the team fight because he can chase you down so far. But because he was shut down by the Mordekaiser, really nothing he could do at the end of the fight there. Beautifully played there by Colonial after they lost their mid laner. They did a great job. But now we back to the Baron here. That's the big play now on the top side. But Vision's kind of tough to get right now. Ooh, flash away there by Napalm. That is an important one. They blow that summoner immediately. It's going to be Colonial Forge turning on that Baron. They know the juggler has to go back to base. Rise teleporting up here to try to defend. Going to leave Yorick by himself down there in that bottom side. But he's going to teleport into. Here comes the curtain call from the Jin. Trying to Great find hook. a Great pick. Hook. Great hook by the Blitzcrank. And there's another one. Hemorrhage is able to find a takedown with that execution. Yasuo doing what damage he can. But a double takedown by the Garen. Napon has now joined the fight. Yorick, he can do only so much. He is just a man. And a double takedown for the 80 carry of Parkview. Part of the problem of the team gone for Colonial. They have decent tankiness, but the damage on the Baron is just mediocre. They can't get it down fast enough despite you know chunking out the enemy jungler. They then put themselves in terrible terrain. They're caught in a choke point because of the side they are on with the Baron. They can't get away here. The curtain call opening things up was huge as well to find the slow as the initial damage. They just got caught there trying to get on the Baron and they didn't get off it fast enough, couldn't run away. Couldn't fight. They're in a terrible situation. Parkview capitalized once again. They get behind. They find the opening. They capitalize on the mistake from Colonial, and now they're back in this with Baron, and uh, potentially they could get the soul later on with his next dragon. And they just broke this game wide open, getting the you know team fight win plus another turret. Baron very clean escape with the realm warp. That has been the best ability this game. I, the amount of things they have done with the realm warp. Now they lost that fight with the beautiful realm warp catch, but. They have done so many things with the Realm Warp. Sometimes that can be an ability that's kind of underutilized because teams just aren't really too organized or the opportunities aren't there. But Parkview have utilized the Realm Warp so so well. Like, it's such a powerful ability if you could use it correctly. And they've used it correctly, it feels like every time they've used it. It's been, it's it's such a great ability. They've used it to its fullest potential here. And that has been one of the biggest tools. The rise damage has been amazing, but the ultimate is what really has made this pick just so valuable. Some incredible map movements coming in from Cat Take Skill. Obviously, Ryze does as well when he has that skill transferred over to that champion. Okay, now we're looking at this game 30 minutes into the game. Dead even almost in gold. Just 500 gold separating these two teams. When we looked at this like two or three minutes ago, it was a four or 5,000 gold advantage in the way of Colonial Forge. So massive turnaround here by Parkview off the back of that Baron. They haven't been able to really get a lot of pushing done with it. They do have a good 1-3-1 one one comp with the Garen and the Rise. The important thing, though, is right now lacking the teleport, the Realm Warp, a lot of that global pressure. So they, they have the Realm Warp back up and no teleport. The problem with the Realm Warp is the range is only gets you between one lane, basically. It can't get you across the entire map. So if they decide to go, like, top and bot, um, the Rise can't really get there because you just can't get across the entirety of the map. So they can only really go one lane across if you have the Realm Warp and you're relying on that for the for you to join your team. But I think the other side of this is Parkview may be playing slow because they don't want to throw just throw this away. And they also want to play for a pick like this. Here comes the Realm Warp teleported three members into the turret. Stun not going to come through. Here comes a curtain call. Try to disrupt some members. 
Rest of the players are walking in. Zach trying to soak up as much damage as he can, but Hemorrhage now on a takedown spree. Leona will fall soon after a double takedown, and now Lucian is the next target. Yorick doing what he can in the back line, but not even able to win the 1v1 against the Rise. A triple takedown for the Garen, and now Parkview has the Rise set on that soul. This is amazing. What a game from them. 10,000 or 3,000 gold down to 10 minutes. And now they come back to this, and 32 minutes into the game, they have Dragon Soul with four dragons. They've got Baron here for a little bit longer. I'd say they they are in a great position to win this game. I don't see how Colonial comes back. They've lost every fight recently. Another great use of Realm Warp, and another good hook to catch that Mordekaiser. I was questioning this Blitzcrank because I worried, like, who would he hook? Well, the answer is he just finds the perfect target in the two fights we've seen recently. Around the Baron, he found the Lucian. That time he found the Mount Mordekaiser because the Mordekaiser was just running away because he knew he couldn't win. So I think this has been a pleasant surprise that this Blitzcrank has worked out. And also that Parkview have had the mental fortitude to come back from being down a pretty decent margin early on in the game. I especially want to highlight Hemorrhage up there in the top side. I mean, he started off 0-2. He was going up against a 5-1 Yorick who teleported in the bot lane, got a couple of takedowns, just making his life miserable up there in the top side, was able to keep a calm head, farmed his way back into the game, and then back-to-back -back team fights now, triple takedowns. Now six, two, and four on this Garen. He's having an amazing performance. I think that he is kind of the epitome of, of the team for Parkview right now, where it's been, yeah, a couple things went wrong in the early game, but they say stay strong. They don't get tilted. They don't like lose their heads. And they just come back, play a slow, steady game, and all of a sudden things just open up for them. They just explode on the enemy team. And they're like, hey guys, uh, we're still here to play. Like this isn't over. All of a sudden Park, you are in the lead here looking to end the game. Uh, Gaty a little bit too aggressive. The Jade gets caught out. Let's bounce falling on top of him. So much CC, but he gets away. They rally on top of him. He's going to go golden for a few more moments but shut down by Takei. Here comes the Realm Warp, try to rejoin the fight. The Rise is so low, he's gonna fall as well. And all of a sudden, Colonial Forge is retaking control. Two for two, not the end of the world here for Parkview, but they need to definitely back off here. They can't stay around too long. But that was the difference there. Parkview have been the ones initiating the fights, finding the openings. That time, Colonial Gage is onto them. They find the opening here because of the soul, because of that Infernal Soul, they can't really win the fight too well. And they spend so much time trying to get the Jin. So that's the good news for Parkview, but they need to stop walking in the enemy team like that. They've only done it once, but that might they can't do it again because that might throw the game back to Colonial here. They need to continue to play their strengths. They were so good with the Realm are finding someone, you know, unawares or a few people unawares here, jumping on Colonial and not, you know, it can't be the other way around because they can't react to engages too well. Immobile AD carry now without a flash. Rise decently mobile once he gets that, that phase rush proc, but he doesn't actually have a dash or anything to get away here, so they need to definitely not get engaged on, especially with this leona Zach combo, so hard to get away from. And that was Namor once again, stepping up a little bit too far. We saw him be the first to fall in that fight around the Infernal Dragon that would have initially given Parkview the soul, but he face-checked that bush, got taken out early, and they lost that fight. Similar situation here, wanting to go up for those extra couple of auto attacks in the tower, but there's so much long range engage on the side of Colonial. If that Jin is ever just slightly out of position, instantly collapse on that's what gave him the edge. That's, I mean, that's life of an 80 carry, right? One Unfortunately, mistake. Unfortunately, I know it well. <laughs> yeah, one mistake, and it's like, all right, lights out. You know, there's just not much you can do here. Oh, good. Tempted a hook. If they find a hook on the Lucian, I mean, that, that just can possibly end the game because that probably means Baron here, unless a healer steal from the Zach, so. Oh, this would be a big pick. They Ooh, interrupt. Great interrupt on the Elastic Slingshot. Going to go into the left bounce to try to find some space. But meanwhile, on the back line, it is Hemorrhage, and it is Cat Take Skill wreaking havoc. Hemorrhage now dominating. They've already found one. Net spawn, or Nate Pawn is going to be the second one to fall. And Park View are just taking over the rift, and they are all doing it on the backs of Hemorrhage, who finds, actually, that we're going to be going over to Cat Take Skill snipes it away, but Sahori, the only remaining member alongside of Takei, both so low, and the base will be officially broken. Now this inhibitor down, and they might just keep going, honestly. I don't see any reason to stop here. The wave clear from Lucian is okay, but not great. They have a cannon. I think they can knock this down and end the game right here. They have that wonderful front line with the Garen, who's going to be regenerating up all that health. Can't take skill. Gets a little bit aggressive here. Pops the Seraph Embrace, tries to buy time. He's just running interference while Parkview yeah, the ends Nexus. the game. They are going to start off this series one to nothing.
What a game from Parkview. Absolutely. That was so well played. It's not often that we see, especially in this meta and in these play versus events, that a team that starts off behind is able to come back to a victory. And not only were Parkview able to do that, but the way they did it as well was just so clean. I think, yeah, they looked fantastic. They fell behind early. Sometimes teams just can't recover from that. I mean, A, it's just hard. But also you added the mental component of like, wow, we're losing guys. But they just, no no worry. It didn't seem like they were panicked at all during that game. They are just like, all right, fine. All right, this is okay. Then they, oh, realm warp. Okay, yeah, we found them in the side. It was just that every time they were just like, all right, it's not a big deal. They come back with another good play. The realm warp that game, every single one was fantastic. The last fight as well, the realm warp caught them, cut them off from escaping back to their base through the jungle here. And then the, the hooks from Blitzcrank were great here. A few missteps from the Jin. Maybe don't walk into that brush. But <laughs> hey, one or two mistakes. If not that's the, end the, the only world. thing we're criticizing, then yeah. you know that it was a good game. Great game from Parkview. And and honestly, that early game was so good on the other side here. I yeah. mean, we're gonna have a great series. One of our best so far. I think this could this could go all three games. What a great series we got so far. Well, that is exactly what we're hoping for. We're gonna go into a short break of these players get ready for game number two. But if it is anything like game number one, you are not going to want to miss it. Stay tuned. Welcome back, everybody, to the Virginia High School League Championships here between Parkview and Colonial Forge. We just saw one of the most competitive games we have seen here in the Play versus League of Legends Championships in, I, I'll, I'll just say hands down, I, just the most competitive I game think, we've seen. I think so. I mean, I don't remember a game closer because that was back and forth the whole time. One, was. You know, one team had the lead in the early game. They kind of swapped, and Parkview came back. And but they what? completed the comeback. Yeah. They were able to turn around such... I don't want to say abysmal. I think that's that's a little bit you know too harsh on them, but a very yeah. rough early game where they fell apart kind of all across the map. They weren't getting advantages anywhere, and we talked about how their composition needed to get ahead early, but they were actually able to find a success later into the game with that Infernal Soul and just some really calculated play cutting their losses in the mid game. Well, I think I think this that game really kind of highlighted the power of the dragons now, especially yeah. the, if you can get a really good soul because the infernal soul one of the best ones. If that was a cloud soul, we may not have yeah, seen a victory not, there. Not, <laughs> not as not not as good. But Colonial Forge, they we were in control of that game for a long time. First ten to fifteen minutes, it was all them, and then Parkview just kind of like accepted the losses, kind of lost the minimum, then turned it around, got something else somewhere on the map, and then started finding picks of their own and started taking over the game. And every time. The Dragon came up. Colonial Forge actually resetting. They were decided that's the time we're going to reset um, because they sort of made all the plays when the Dragons weren't up or they you know, they were about to spawn or, or the, you know, early on people aren't exactly going to go to the Drakes immediately. So it was like, all right, we're going to back now. We're going to use this time to back and then come back out on the map and just continue to push the pace on the map itself as opposed to finding the objectives, the neutral objectives like um, Parkview decided. They were just like, all right, we'll just take Dragon if you're going to give it to us. Like, we don't care. We'll, we'll, we'll take it. And then they just kept taking them the entire game. All of a sudden, they have a soul, and uh, they were ahead in the game, and all of a sudden, just kind of turned around, despite Colonial Forge being ahead for so long. Well, great comeback there by Parkview to turn that one around. Do we chalk it up to just uh, – I mean, obviously, they played it very well, but are we kind of giving them the RNG factor there because of the Dragons? I mean, obviously, they still had some issues in the early game. What do they have to do to make sure that they can win this – 2-0 and not let Colonial Forge take it to a game three. Well, I think they can go to uh, a, a similar strategy like they went to in game one. I don't think that drafting, I think Kha'Zix didn't really work out too well. I think you'd go I for agree. a different jungler there. But I think the strategy of it's fine to not be hyper aggressive early because that's sort of the thing we've been talking about a lot is like we got to go, go, go. I don't think that's really their style. I don't think that's what they should do in game two. I think they should continue to play a bit slower and then find those mid game picks that they were so good at. Because that's the thing that really, you know, screamed to me like that's that was their strength. Is like, all right, we're gonna play a bit of a slower early game, but once we get to you know lane phase starts to kind of wane and starts to end, that's when we really turn it on. We make global plays here. Um, so I think going for another pick support would be good here. Blitz rank was an interesting pick. It worked out pretty well actually, but I think going back to like a Leona is good too. Just something that can sort of engage pick heavy, and then just saying, all right, maybe we go for not a super crazy early game champion, but an Olaf who can power farm, be ready for that mid game spike. Calm, collected, those were the attributes of Parkview in game number one. That's what we're going to be looking to have in game number two. Maybe a slower start into more impactful mid to late game. We're right into the picks and bans, though. We'll see if they decide to take our advice. The team's swapping sides this time around. Colonial Forge will be in the blue side, so they'll get that first pick 
and Parkview will have the counter at the end of the draft. Yeah, and I think on the other side for Colonial Forge, they, they need to push the pace because Parkview have shown that they're really good as a team. They, their team synergy is just top notch. I haven't seen anyone better so far. Colonial Forge, they work well together, but sometimes it feels like their map awareness could be not quite as good as Parkview, which isn't, it's not an insult. Parkview is just that good. But Colonial Forge, I think they need to push the pace. Draft aggressive like they did last game, but be even more aggressive. Also, you know, don't give up dragons for free. I think that's another lesson to take away, but continue to push the pace. That's where they were good, and they just need to end the game early before Parkview can stabilize. Colonial Forge, again, targeting that top side of the map. Hemorrhage, even when forced on to, you know, one of his picks further down the tier list as they threw triple bands at him last time. Once again, the Darius, the Set, and the Jax. He still had a standout performance. So let's see if they can stop some of that bleeding up there in the top side as Parkview take away the Yasuo and the Lucian joining the band table as Sahori did have a very good showing out it in the game one. The Mordekaiser as well. I like Parkview's adaptations. The Mordecai Solution definitely tough to deal with here. On the other side, Colonial Forge is sticking to their guns. They just like yeah. to ban out the top laner. I think that's a little interesting given how powerful the Rise was in game number one. And, you know, there's not too much else to ban, but the Rise to me, I think, would deserve a slot. Um, so kind of interesting to go without it. And first pick, Orn. Very interesting draft so far. First pick, Orn, he's like, so, so the, weird. To this me. is this is interesting to me because it really seems with the way the draft priority has been going and with the bands coming through, I, I feel like they're a little scared of hemorrhage. If, if I'm if I'm bit, being yeah. completely honest, I mean throwing all of your draft resources at this one this one player and him being pushed that far down his tier list and still coming out with the standout performance in game one, it feels like the York is just, hey, let's grab the safest top laner that we can and try to just survive against Hemorrhage, not allow him to get a lead and try to really force elsewhere on the map. That's what they're doing with this aggressive jungler and high CC support. Yeah, the, the, the comments are so far from Colonial Forge. I definitely really like the first pick. Uh, Orn is a little interesting here. I thought there was there's more you can do to exploit the Orn here. They just go with the Garen again, which is fine. But I feel like you could have done more to really punish that first pick because Orn, pretty good laner overall, especially for a tank. But he can still be exploited, especially at range champs like talked about with the set being exploited. But so can the Orn. So kind of interesting to decide to sort of handshake and just say, all right, we'll take the Garen. So kind of interesting there. But I like the adaptation. Getting Leona so good, I think, for Parfi here because. It, it's just kind of a better version of Blitzcrank to me in this meta. Obviously, you can't pull someone in, but you're basically a hard engaged for. It's the same thing, and I think that Leona just fills that role so much better. He's also way tankier um, because of her W, and Aftershock's still really good. I don't know if anyone knew that, but it's really good. So I, I like what both teams have done here. Interesting adaptations, but I, I think both teams are kind of playing to their strengths. Rise and Casting are going to be banned away by Colonial Forge. Caitlyn and Syndra will be the last two bands for Parkview as they lock in the Malzahar for themselves. And ooh, this is interesting. We get to see the Annie coming through. Gonna be joining the Vayne down there in the bot side. A lot of late game power for Colonial Forge. Interesting they pick up the Vayne though. I think that- That is the question mark for me as well. Because, especially because their composition, it's kind of dive heavy, but which makes sense to go for the Vayne. But I feel like there's enough CC peel that you could go for an Aphelios or an MF no problem here. Now, Leona is very good into MF because she can interrupt for the ultimate sometimes. But I think that Aphelios, like, why wouldn't you take him? That's kind of my question here. Like, he just seems that good here. Looks like we're going to go back to the closet because we questioned. However, it does have a little bit of a better place here because the Vayne's going to have to get so aggressive and the Annie is no escape. So I think that the Kha'Zix actually fares much better than the carries this game than it did last game. So Colonial Forge have drafted a little bit into that. And, uh, you know, having comfortable you know, champion to play is good for your jungler. So I, I also, like that. I love the setup that they have now with the Kha'Zix because one of Kha'Zix's big, biggest drawbacks is that he doesn't have any CC. It's hard for him to set up ganks without having laners that have that CC. Well, now you're staring down the barrel of a Leona plus Jen in the bottom side who have multiple areas of long range CC. A Malzahar in the mid lane who has one of the most oppressive CCs in the game with just that point and click lockdown for four or five seconds, allowing Kha'Zix to get that damage off. So I think now we're in a position where we could see Napon set up to shine here in the early game as long as he doesn't, you know, get visited too often by Takei on this Olaf. That is a concern. The 1v1, he loses 100%. He's just going to have to leap away. Like, yeah. That's just how it goes. So I think that the Olaf is set up to do some really good things here, um, to be honest, because mid lane should be a relatively even in wave clear early on. The Malzar is a bit better later on in the game, but like in the first couple levels, which is really what we're concerned with because of the Olaf invading early on. 
it's it's fine. It'll be even here. Top lane, similar story. Bot lane, again, similar story where the Vayne gets outscaled in, in Wayflare, but at the early game, it doesn't really matter. So I think that there's definitely tools here for the Olaf to get aggressive and try and you know, shut down this Kha'Zix here. So we'll see how that jungle matchup develops. But I think both sides have drafted good combos that fit themselves here. The big question marks, though, again, uh, to me, the vein a little bit interesting. I think the Annie's great with this combination, but the vein seems a little out of place here. So I'm a little bit concerned about that in the Kha'Zix game, which we questioned. We'll see how those two champions fare here. They have a really high ceiling, but the floor also really, really low. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll see whether it'll be at the top or the bottom as we get here into game two. Parkview, one win away from closing this one out. Two to zero, Colonial Forge fighting that right to get to game number three, the play versus 2019 Fall League of Legends Championships for the Virginia High School League. It all It's all here now. The good news for Colonial is that they, you know, they go for the game, nothing there, but they do have this Olaf here, which I think is a great pick. And the, the way the map set up, usually what would happen is the Kha'Zix would go bot side, Minions start with, you know, double leash from your bot lane and then go top side. However, it looks like that's not going to be the case. So what I think might happen is the Olaf will start red, he'll clear that, and then either do a full clear bot side, and then and, and hopefully he'll realize that Kha'Zix has not actually gone for the leash bot side um, based on the way the you know the enemy bot lane shows. So that way he can invade on the blue buff, he'll know exactly where the Kha'Zix is because the Kha'Zix definitely wants to get both buffs early on here. So unless the Kha'Zix is some tour strike goose stuff and goes to the enemy blue buff, which I think is a bad decision because the Olaf shows there, he's screwed. So I think that he should, the Olaf is actually in a really good spot here to invade on the enemy blue buff and punish the Kha'Zix early on. Let's see if he goes for that. This, you know, he might also just want to be pathing up to that top side, try to protect the Orn in that matchup against the Garen, maybe assuming that Napon would start on that blue and try to path up there for an early gank, tr maybe potentially trying to match that. We'll see how it all shakes out, though, as both junglers will be starting on opposite sides of the map. Shouldn't see any crossover for them too early if everything you know, yeah. goes civilly. As now you can see, they're both heading to their other side of the jungle. Going to be working out a full clear. Both of them opting to leave the Krugs. It seems it seems like Yolof not going to go for that. I mean, Olaf's such a good farmer early on that it's fine to just kind of like power farm, because he'll be ahead of the Kha'Zix, assuming they farm it like a similar rate and the Olaf doesn't like just walk around for no reason. So the Olaf should be ahead in terms of that. And that could be a good way to, to gain an advantage in this game here is just you out farm on the Olaf and then the Kha'Zix just won't be able to deal with you um, later on in the game here as opposed to just trying to punish him early on here. Cause he didn't really have too much pushing going on, especially in the bot side wasn't pushing. So it was a bit risky to invade on the blue buff because of the way that worked out. All right, now you can see an early push here from Namor and Romero. So they are shoving here into the vein and the Nautilus. They have the jungler on their side of the map. Napon down to about half health, but a little bit of healing packed into his kit. If he can get that scuttle crab afterwards, he should be nice and topped up. Might look for a gank here. Right now we see Decay, he is invading, at least for, for some more. So we've seen both junglers just go for an entire full clear. They're gonna be trading those scuttles on either side of the map as well as they have just spawned. And a pretty even map state so far. Biggest Olaf difference. Has a top, though. Here comes Garen's Olaf into the top. So Garen has a pretty massive CS lead for himself. Can he get away, though? Will he be able to flash away from the axes there, trying to avoid getting slowed once again? Very respectful by, by Hemorrhage. No ignite as well on the Garen top this time. Oh, but here comes into the top side. Yasuo has to flash away. That was a massive burst of damage coming in isolated against that Kha'Zix. It's important the wave wasn't there because he got so much more damage off because of that isolation bonus there, and then obviously the Malzahar put down his damage. So really good timing, honestly, on the way that, that worked out here. So good job, the Kha'Zix oh, back for more. Immediately for a return gank. Stun gonna come in from the Annie. You can see the Malzahar wanting to push it, but realizing without a wave, he can't dive that tower. Yeah, they were relying on the Silence to hit on that gank. Because if the Silence hit, then Annie can't get the stun off, and the Kha'Zix will be able to get another auto or Q off, and that'll, that'll be able to be enough damage to take down the Annie. So it was really unfortunate the Silence didn't miss. Good sidestep there. Um, otherwise, that for sure would have been uh, Annie going back to the spawning platform. Right now, though, good early game by Parkview. They're already a couple hundred gold ahead, thanks to some CS advantages, both in the top and bottom lane and blowing those early summoners, you know, by Napon. 
able to take advantage of the Ani. Hemorrhage is missing his flash from the top side, but that's a tanky Garen. He's much harder to actually lock down. And so from what was a slower start to the early game last time around, this is a much better look, at least in the first couple minutes for Parkview. Definitely interesting because, like I said, they drafted this Olaf, which is just better early on than the Kha'Zix generally. But he's been able to get off more ganks, and Olaf got the flash in the top side, but the Kha'Zix has matched that with the play in the mid lane here, and the side lanes are going really well at 19 to 35 in the top lane in CS, and bot lane, not a big lead, but you know a little bit here, and same thing in the mid lane. So this is actually a really great start from Parkview. I mean, like, what if they if they come out to a lead, like? Is the game going to be super lopsided then because of how good they played from behind last game? Who knows? But well, will Colonial be the one this time around who grabs some of those early dragons? I think that's going to be the big test is who can start picking up these side objectives, you know, trading pressure around the map. Because that's a big thing that we saw as Garen falls so low up there in the top side. But last game, Parfi, when they were losing on one side, they were always winning on the other side. Now, Romero could be in trouble. Look for the hook. It goes way past onto the Jin, who has to flash away. That was a hook and a half right there by the Nautilus, but Teleport gonna come in from Hemorrhage once again. This is Yorick first well. takedown going over to Romero. Parkview off to an early start. Yorick now, Ignite gonna go down onto him. Hook under turret. Romero has gone a little bit too far, but there's the ultimate from the Malzahar. Finally level six, Ornhorn gonna put down a little bit more damage, but two for zero in favor of Parkview. Well, one back, they got the Leona, but they, they still are definitely in the positive in that play. They go for more. They're gonna be diving the turret now. That Garen is so tanky, juggling that aggro so well. And they're gonna pick up a third for themselves. So again, they lose two members, but hey, that was a great play for Parkview here. Gonna get some plannings as well. A great start to this game. Now they're the aggressors, and like we said, maybe Glody will be the ones to be play well from behind, but if they're losing at this stage in the game, it's definitely concerning for me because that Olaf is supposed to be so powerful. But the way that worked out, a priority TP by Hemorrhage. It didn't look like Yorick had a way interrupted, so he just tried to just go ahead and TP in as well. Uh, a bit unfortunate there uh, that Hemorrhage gets in first because the, the play goes really well for Parkview because of that advantage of the, the Garen getting there first. So really nice job. And now we can fight over this Ocean Drake because Ocean's great early on here. And like we talked about last game, the Dragons mattered so much in the end. So I think that we'll probably have some fight over this, or at least some dance around it. Maybe some wards being put down, but I, I, I think with Olaf, like, you definitely want to go at least try and take it because he's he's really good at soloing those dragons. Ocean Dragon popping up means, unfortunately, we will not have that soul. So that's, you know, one of the, the big combat souls taken off the table. But if you're looking at Colonial in their composition, they don't have to succeed right now. I mean, they do have an Orn and a Vein. Very, two very strong late game champions. Orn is going to allow multiple thousands of gold to be pumped into his team as he levels up. That will start to close that gap. And then Vayne, one of the best scaling ADCs in the game. The amount of true damage will be able to very easily punch through that Garen and that Leona, which was something they struggled with last time. You know, uh, actually being able to take that Garen down. So th there is a world where Colonial can you know, theoretically outscale this one. Hang on, though, they're looking for a fight right now. They don't want to wait. Kha'Zix in the back line, chunking out the vein, taking a lot of damage in return. Ragnarok going to come through as Olaf chases down Namor. But here comes the Malzar to try to protect his laners. Romero, one more auto tech away. Timbers is going to secure it there. And it's going to be a one for zero in favor of Colonial that time. Is up here in the top side. We see a bit of a wet noodle fight. York and Hemorrhage, neither of them are realistically going to fall here. Uh, well, hold on. Call oh, Forge God, maybe? Hornhorn. Yeah. Garen still has Flash, so he should be fine. The Garen, the Orn flashing in front of him, though, forces out that Flash there. Not not a bad fight at all for the Orn there. Nicely done. I think you're right totally about that, that late game scaling here for the Vayne. The biggest concern for me, though, is just that Vayne's going to have to get in the, enemy, the face of the enemy, so... There's just so many things she's got to dodge. There's so many There's things. There's so much CC as well. Exactly. Leona, Kha'Zix can just one-shot her. Ooh, speaking of Kha'Zix, trying to find vengeance over that dragon. Jin opening up with the curtain call. Napawn falling very low, though. That or that Vayne is just turning around the fight. Sahori is able to find another takedown. Oh. Ultimate from the Nautilus. Going to buy a little bit more time. Double kill from the Vayne. She goes for a triple, and she's able to set him up and knock him down. Well, I mean... If you hand her three kills, <laughs> then it's not as big a concern. 
Like if you, that vein hits late game by 20 minutes, then it then it doesn't <laughs> then matter. It doesn't None matter. of this matters. Just ignore us. We're not. We don't make any sense. But that was really bad uh, for Parkview. They, the Jin also took the last <laughs> shot over the wall with the blast cone, so he didn't actually have any autos when he went over the oh, wall. Oh man! So that didn't feel too great here. But now the 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 vein is going to be very strong here. Probably has a couple thousand gold in inventory. So this is. Um, the situation turning around a little bit here. Again, there's so, so many threats to her. I mean, she's got to buy a QSS for the Malzahar, and she wants to get two items as quickly as possible. And uh, the Garen also a big threat. If she walks into him, silence into the Demacian Justice. It's like, all right, well, that's a concern. So there are still a lot of tools to shut her down for Parkview, but if she does get too far ahead, then that is that is just not good, not good at all, because she she's a true champion that can one v nine with her with her kit. Oh, we see Hemorrhage might be up here in a one v two. Stakay has the Ragnarok available again. Hemorrhage, no flash. He knows he's done for. Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> no, there's no way with with uh, Ornhorn and Ragnarok and not having flash would have taken a miracle to get him out of that one alive. I've seen I've seen more people miss the recast on the Ornhorn than I care to admit. It's it happened more times than you would think. So I've got faith maybe hemorrhage with the fancy footwork to get out. And then you know they miss the ultimate and they miss the axe. It's happened before. I you know Stick A has smite though. Stick, he was in smite range. Stay open to the possibility. Sometimes you forget what button it's bound to, you know. <laughs> so Sometimes you uh, smite a All these options here for Hemorrhage up there in the top side, but right now a good hook is going to start off a 2v3 flashing into the Leona ultimate. That vein so low, the flash forward shut down by Nate Pawn. Namor did fall at the beginning of that fight as well. Oh, Suppressed right. from the Malzahar. A couple turret shots, not going to fall. Double takedown for Nate Pawn. It's start few starts to turn it around. Okay, that was one of the rare instances of Parkview not having great communication. He used the... the the Malzar used the Nether Grasp, and then the Leona flashed in. Was like, wait, sorry, I didn't mean to do that, and just like walked back out. But another he great what fight. Was about yeah, to. another yeah, another great fight for Parkview here. And now with the bot lane shut down, they're losing mid lane, but they get that turret here in the bot side here, and they shut down the vein, which is really Who's really important. Who's gonna get first turret though? This is a race for it. Shelly might even be able to get Come that on, second Shelly. charge off. That W from Jin oh, no. might not have bought them enough time for the first turret, but at least secured that Shelly was not going to get another charge off. Oh, hold on. Leona? Romero, he should be fine. I mean, he's got the W right. to make him extra tanky. Fell very low there. They finally trade a turret. But now the Nautilus, he's on the hunt. One good hook could put him in range. Here comes the K to look for more of the flash forward. The Ragnarok smited from the heavens. He found the right button. <laughs> Is Nate Pawn going to get condemned into the wall? Condemned is exactly what he is. Is actually the ignite. I think that was the E from the Nautilus is going to take that one. Mm, you yeah. would have rather that shut down go into the Bane's pocket, but for sure, who doesn't want a faster uh, locket? I mean, well, I mean, technically it's gold for the Vein because he's going to build locket for her, and then she's going to get a shield. So technically it's gold for Vein. Spoken like a true support player. I mean, I'm just trying to be a good. <laughs> I'm trying to be a good teammate. That's all. I'm helping you out. I'm sure Vang would much rather have a Rage Blade. Well, but but what you can't use Rage Blade if you get blown up before you get to use it. <laughs> so I need to have I need to have Locket anyway. And the control wards I need so that you don't you know I, you don't have to face check. I'm just being the good guy here. It's it's not it's not I'm not taking your kill. I'm ADCs your, need taking. all the resources. No no no, no. that's wrong. <laughs> well, Sahori right now is the big carry on his team. Three, two, and four. Has the Blade of the Rune King finished in his inventory. Has done fairly well in these last couple fights, dishing out lots of damage. Here, though, we see Takei trying to once again for gank in the top side. There comes the uh, Ornhorn. Didn't land that one, but Takei running him down. The rest of the team has come up to join. Yasuo is able to pinch in that Garen. And now it's going to be a numbers advantage here for Colonial. Double takedown for the Annie. And a hook onto Napon might mean more. There comes the He's ultimate more charge over the, the wall. He's okay. Okay. He's good. Vayne, no flash. Uh, we could have seen Nautilus flash over and try to secure that one even more, but Vayne having to walk the long way around. They might get him anyway. They're looking for it. Vayne starting off that tank is now here. Can they burn him down? Olaf, one more turret shot. Will not be enough. And one more unanswered takedown goes over to Colonial. Yeah, Colonial don't want to get swept here. They're not in it. Like they're, they're they're playing their game again, where they're aggressive. They keep finding fights here, and despite getting the you know their 80 carry shut down after she got a you know, triple around the dragon, they come right back. They they just not no fear from them. 
like Parkview last game, it's like they're not deterred by it. Now, Colonial is playing a different style where they're just like, we're just going to fight. Parkview a little more patient, but Colonial is like, why would we not fight? This game is about fighting. Like, what else would we do? <laughs> the team fight team will always team fight. Exactly. Who needs objectives? That's not, that's not how you win the game, right? We're actually in a very similar situation to game one, though. Colonial, 15 minutes in, they're about 2,000 gold up. Uh, you know, give or take a little yeah. bit. And we see Parkview, they're starting to trade those objectives. They were able to get that Infernal Dragon for themselves. It is going to be a Cloud Soul this time around, so we're not going to see any crazy combat souls swinging the fights of the game. That is good news for Colonial, who is in the lead and don't want that extra complete well, condition the in the Cloud game. Well, the Cloud Soul is very good for two people specifically. The Olaf and the Vayne really utilize Cloud Soul Both really them, well. Both of them, however, happen to be on Colonial's team. True. So but. Parkview getting the soul isn't going to be as impactful as last game. Yeah, but like, I'm they just trying to like look at the positive. Yeah, I'm looking at the positive. Absolutely. If they get a cloud soul, it is still going to be massive for them. Leona having yeah. that extra move speed to close the gap. Uh, Kha'Zix especially going to have a lot, a huge burst of move speed after that ultimate be able to reposition well. So we do see some good uses of that soul, and I'm sure both these teams will probably heavily prioritize it. I'm still upset that we didn't get another Infernal Soul, but it's, you know. Uh, that would have been great. I'm trying Infernal to, I'm Ocean are the, are the yeah. worst two early drakes. That means you won't get the Soul. Yeah. Oh, hold on. This Ooh. Is good... Okay. Well, not, nothing to say about that. Don't, don't go into that brush. <laughs> that one does not belong to you anymore, Nate Pond. Yeah. Colonial have put down their flag. It belongs to so them. That's, that's also a result of the last couple of minutes where there's been significant investments in the top side from Colonial where they took that outer turret and there's a big fight in the jungle. They put down vision while that happened and now they've lost control of the top side of the map. It's sort of getting sliced um, a little bit in. So they don't really have full control of that top side of the map. So it's really hard for Kha'Zix to establish vision now towards the Baron pit, which is concerning for later on in the game. But also just like get those camps. And obviously can't just walk in there because we just Ooh, saw it. the K. He's getting the bot side. Immediate flash by the Jin. Ooh. The hook not gonna land as Leona flashes away. Wanted to make sure Yasuo couldn't get in range, but investing those resources means the team should be able to take down this turret. However, Parkview is collapsing. There comes Leona ultimate. No loss Thunder Nurse where he's gonna get shut down. Support grabbing credit for that one now. The Annie gonna be locked up, not even able to get Timbers off. Is so shutdown's gonna go over to Namor. Ornhorn gonna come through, try to buy some space, gonna land on a two. Garen flashing away, will regen up in that fight. Not able to take down Kha'Zix either. So many members of Parkview, so low. As Cat takes skill, finds another takedown. He will fall as a Jin tries to find some more. York's gonna go golden. Romero playing lockdown duty, keeping them from running away. But so far, it is a three for one trade in favor of Parkview. Bad news is they can't get any objectives. They can maybe get the inner tower, but there's no dragon, and the Rift Herald's on the other side of the map. So there's no objectives. They won't even go for the turret, it looks like. So Parkview, big fight for them. They don't get anything off it, really. And this is definitely the Parkview that we saw from last game, where it's like they capitalized on the mistake from Colonial, who overstepped there. But they didn't get the objectives. That was the big thing. After every Parkview fight, they got something huge after it. That was like the thing that made them turn around that game. Right now, they're not, they don't have that. They didn't get that off that last fight here. They also lost that tower. So in terms of like, you look at the map, yeah, you, you net gold, but you don't really get anything on the map, which is how Parkview turned around that game in game one. However, I'm sure they'll still take a three for one trade. I mean, yeah, I'm not, they're not <laughs> gonna turn it down, out I'm just ten. saying. Uh, only objectives on the map right now is going to be the Rift Herald. Only going to be there for about a minute and a half now. We do see Takei going to start that one up. Wanting to make sure that it doesn't just expire. Did pop the Stryer's broom, Bloom, so Parkview should have some information that this is being started up. Doesn't look like they want to contest that. No one's in really position to do it right now, so it's definitely best to, to give it up. But giving up two Rift Heralds... It's concerning, especially doing it at this time of the game. When you have, when you have the Rift Herald this late in the game, it becomes available while Baron is up. And if you can put the Rift Herald down and force the enemy team away and do Baron, especially when you have a champion like Vayne who builds items that are good at taking Baron, her kit's good at taking Baron, and she's an AD carry, which is a class that's good at taking Baron. So they actually so what have you're telling me is she's good at taking she's Baron. She's good at taking Baron. So uh, that's concerning to me, is if they're able to leverage this Rift Herald, especially if they drop it in the bot lane, now the problem is the Olaf took it, so he can't actually be in bot lane, put it down, and then run to top side unless he like ults to get there or something. But even then, it takes him a long time to get there. So I think that the Rift Herald can be leveraged to get Baron, but it's not quite as effective as you get into your top laner. 
And it's gonna be dropped right here in the mid lane as they wanna try to pressure this dragon coming up. So try and utilize the pressure of that objective to be creating numbers advantage. Right now, Hemorrhage is gonna be stuck clearing that one out. Might get the ch charge off anyway. Here comes the Ornhorn to buy Shelly some time. And they're all collapsing now onto the Garen. Will he be able to survive? Condemned, bounced around. It's a bouncy house. And Hemorrhage is not having fun. He's gonna look at a gray screen for a couple seconds. They can go for Inip here. Parkview is busy with the Dragon. They're able to yeah. take it down, but can they get back wow. in time? In her inhibitor turret, gone now. Shelly has another charge left in her. The inhibitor will fall too. And Colonial, they trade a measly Cloud Drake for an inhibitor. What will they be able to get out with though? Sahori is able to find a takedown as the Leona just comes They're in. They're running away. <laughs> Straight for her own doom. Takei now flash over the wall, trying to find the jungler, and this might actually... No, 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 they can't end no, on this, can they? They? Can't, they can't end here. They need another... They need a super minion wave, which isn't going to be here for a little bit. They might be looking for it, though. They have this is, a three-member advantage. They don't have They don't have good wave clear because they have a Vayne. Okay, they're, so they're going to be back backing off, off yeah. for that Baron, but what a turnaround there from Colonial. That was really Saying, smart. Yeah. Parfu, you want your dragon? You can have it. We will take your base. That was a brilliant play. They dropped Rift Herald. I thought they were going to trade Rift Herald for the dragon. I was like, Rift Herald for Cloud Dragon? Like, I don't know about that one. And then it was like, oh, wait, no, we're just going to go to that mid lane. <laughs> that was a brilliant play. They kind of bait switched them, too, because Parfu were, like, confused because they sent the Garen back to deal with the Rift Herald and then try and test the dragon with the other four. But then they kind of got outmaneuvered, and Colonial just chased through that little um, pathway in the jungle. Really smart movement by Colonial. And now, hold on, they got to be careful. Okay, they're okay. But uh, now they actually have that inhibitor open. It's not the ball lane inhibitor, which is the best when Baron's up, but it is an inhibitor that's going to put a lot of pressure on Parkview to try and wave through this while also contesting Baron here. And without fast, they can take it now because of the vein. You have Colonial actually in a really good spot to secure this next Baron here. Obviously not a permanent buff, but that three minutes can be so valuable if you can get a lot off it. And with already one hit down, I mean, one Baron might be the end of the game. That it could. And now talking about that Baron Slaying Machine, Sahori there on your screen, now with the Rage Blade completed. Yeah. So no we'll QSS be even though. more dangerous in these fights. Working on that QSS, yeah. uh, the Nautilus also has that locket completed. You know, if they had gotten that shutdown, she'd have QSS right now. But <laughs> um, no, it actually is really important to have the QSS because of the Malzahar, but the Yona as well. Um, so two crucial people to stay away from. But with Vayne's range, you can't really do that. So getting to assess the next priority for sure. And she really needs that for the next fight because if she gets you know ulted on the next fight, Annie just doesn't have the damage to deal with the entire team and the rest of the team, you know. Like Olaf is kind of falling off now. So this is definitely concerning for me that, you know, maybe if Parkview just press R on uh, <laughs> the Vayne, that's a problem. But hey, they've, they've shown me how good they, they can be here after I thought they wouldn't have a chance in the mid-game. I thought that Parkview was too good at, at that time in the game, but they outmaneuvered Parkview with that, that with that Rift Herald. Now they're looking for an aggressive play here. Ornorn going to come through. That is the jungler caught out right away. First takedown is going to go over to Parkview as Jin shuts down the support, but in the back line, Takei is able to take down the jungler. Going to be junglers traded there so far. It is Parkview running away, 2v3. That Mel's are just barely staying alive as Colonial. They know they have the advantage and they are pushing. Well, Malzar ulted the vein, but guess what saved her? I, I, I don't want to say it. You don't want to say <laughs> it? Lockett saved her, so clearly giving the shutdown of the Nautilus was the right call. And now they win the team fight in Colonial. I don't think an end here, especially with curtain call coming up, but they're going to go for the next turrets. That is what they're going for. One next turret is already down. The Orn getting stunned up there. Able to dash away to safety. Will they actually be able to find the collapse? Leona has the home guard. She's looking. Ultimate just came available. No flash though. Will the Moby Beast be enough? It's actually a teleport play into the backside. Good condemn away by the Bane. She's going to get shut down. Gold in the pocket of Namor. And that is two quick takedowns for Park View. Massive overstep there by Colonial. Now the Baron is a threat. The Baron take isn't amazing from Parkview, but with two members down, especially the 80 carry of Colonial, they should be able to take this with minimum threat here. Looks like the Olaf is going to... He's going towards Dragon. No, he's going towards... He's actually going towards the bot lane. He wants to trade a turret for this, at least. But Baron's going to go over to Colonial for... Or Parkview, for sure. You see Take moving down to that bottom lane. Should be able to pick this one up, no problem. She doesn't, no, he doesn't even have, have a wave. wave. Yeah, 
So yeah, yeah, just a massively good play by Parkview. A little bit over aggressive by Colonial trying to stick around to end that game. Yeah, that, I don't really, yeah, I didn't really understand that play too much. And they got, got a, a Nexus turret. turret, but he traded for two takedowns, shutdowns, yeah. and a Baron. They went too far, I think, for sure. That was uh, definitely a mistake there. They still have this incredibly powerful vein now with an upgrade Blade of the Rune King, the QSS now finally completed, plus Merc Treads. Um, so she's incredibly strong, but so is the Jin now. He's starting to ramp up. He's on three items here. He's actually ahead of her um, to a degree, so. The Jin is starting to do quite a lot of damage with, you know, an Infernal scale, which is not bad. Now second Cloud Dragon up on the table. This would be Drake number two for Colonial, number three for Barkview, who wants to go in great. Leona ultimate. Jin opening up with the curtain call. Are they able to get to the back line? Namor on a rampage. And there goes the support as the well. Main, it's going to be ADCs battling each other, but Jin wins out. Double takedown for Hemorrhage is now Yorick, the only remaining member of Colonial, just got wiped in that fight. And it is going to be an ace for Parkview. Well, that was the fight that Vayne was going to pop off. Everything lined up for her. Leona goes on to her in the back line, but she ults away, takes her down, and now is looking in the back line, gets on the Jin, all of a sudden smacked in the face. And that was all the tools we talked about that can shut down the Vayne. She just walks in the enemy team there. They look at, oh, hey, uh, okay, we'll just hit you now because you walked into us. Uh, that's the problem with the Vayne is you have to get so deep in the enemy team. And she did such a great job for the first part of that fight, and all of a sudden the damage just came crashing down on her once her front line was gone, and well, it, it was over. to me in that fight, Colonial tunneled very hard on trying to stop Namor. When you saw the initial engage, Leona was able to get a, I believe it was either a two or a three man ultimate. That was, and from yeah, that point, you know, you saw a Nautilus and an Olaf in a vein all walk straight towards the, the Jin. But he's sitting at the back of the line, and they were trying to interrupt that ultimate, but the amount of silences that came through, it looked like an entire team just standing <laughs> around doing nothing for about 10 seconds. It looked just like my solo queue games. The, well, the, part of the problem, too, was the terrain there, because there was a huge yeah. choke point going in the jungle. There was also gin traps, I think, set up before that. And so, so how difficult was it for them to actually get to that back line? Beautiful yeah. setup there by Parkview to convert into that team by one. The Annie also has the potential to... Um, like one shot someone. She's got Spellbinder plus all the other AP items in her inventory. She has a lot of burst damage. Um, so full rotation can take out the Jin. That's like the one way I see them winning a fight is if um, Dad Yasuo <laughs> takes takes out the Jin. That's kind of a way I can see them winning, but Flash on Annie is pretty big to have up for that. Now they're gonna be looking to catch out Cat Takes Skill. He's all alone here. He needs the ultimate onto the Annie. Actually able to take her down will at least be a one-for-one one trade. A huge chunk of damage onto Sahori as well. Doesn't look like they're going to lose too much for that to go ahead and find it. Yeah, it doesn't look like they're going to lose the mid lane turret here. So a little bit too quick. The Malzar didn't like stagger his wave because the Garen's still working his wave up and the mid lane was also behind. So kind of a desync in terms of the waves. The waves were crashing. You want them all the waves to come in at, at, at the same time. So that way, if you do commit to one of the lanes, like the enemy team tries to go and pick you off, the rest of your team can knock down turrets or objectives or whatever is on the other side of the map. Because they were desync, the mini waves weren't ready to take stuff down when they did go for the pick on the Malzar. Not a great position for Cat Take Skill, but still a good job. In the 1v2, able to pick up a trade kill. That was so massive, being able to take out that massive carry so they couldn't have a team fight win. Orn Horn gonna come through, just gonna find the Garen in the back line. It is Decay. They are looking for that Jin right now. Teleport gonna come through. Here comes Hemorrhage. Annie, shut down the Jin. That is massive. Hemorrhage is unstoppable. You see the jungler flashing away. The Garen, such a raid boss here. He's taking so much damage, he's still alive. There's no way. Triple takedown. Can they finish him off? The Orn chasing him down has the regen coming through. Now trying to fight against these void lanes. Here comes the Bane, trying to clean up. The state spawn is able to find the final isolated Q. And part few is turning around the fight once again. Double takedown for Nate Pawn, and now they have the members to find some more. Tumbles in the wrong direction, can't find the Kha'Zix there. This Vayne pick, so risky, it's worked out to a degree, but continuously shut down in these really 5v5 team fights by the enemy side here. An amazing fight by the Garen as well. Hemorrhage once again, popping me off. Mediocre early game, like okay, but not great. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, it's 20 minutes. <laughs>
uh, I guess I'm going to play now, guys. Like, all of a sudden, he comes out of nowhere as the Garen. He starts to become just a complete raid boss, as you said, just like taking everyone down. 20 minutes, they wake him up from his nap, say, OK, time yeah, to play with two hands now. Yeah, he's, he's playing with one hand while he's, he's, he's like, I don't know, playing. While watching Netflix. While watching Netflix, he's got a movie. He's playing, <laughs> like, I don't know, Pokemon or something else on the other screen. He's like, all right, oh, guys, we're playing now? OK, great. He's, like, woken up, and all of a sudden, yeah, the, the true version of Hemorrhage has come alive. And, I mean, like you said, this happened last game, too. And going for a bit of a different build this time, more tanky, more team fight oriented And you saw, especially with the Conqueror, how difficult he was to take down. He had four members, you know, with a vein just wailing on him. And he's able to find a double takedown, stay alive with that Triumph Brox, healing him up so much. Now going to be working into is most likely a Spirit Visage, so even more healing on top of that. However, as this game continues to go on, I want to draw attention to the Orn and the upgraded items. Every one of those worth, on an average, of about 1,000 gold in combat stats. The Abyssal Mask in Orn's inventory, worth a lot more. It's actually around like 1,400 or 1,500. It's pretty insane. Right now, the part view, they're just going to straight up take a Baron. The gold lead actually doesn't exist because of the Orn items. Well, it exists a little bit now because they just got a bunch of gold off Baron. But it doesn't actually exist to, to the degree it looks like. It's really only a couple hundred, a thousand gold because of the Orn items here. But now with Baron buff, a huge play by Parkview, we're going to have here another fight. Orn Horn, Leona ultimate into the back line right now. Jinjo is so much damage on the backside, and they're just trying to get to the carries. The Vein has nothing but brick walls to auto attack. Nate Spawn is going to find the jungler with a final isolated W and teleporting into the base. Parkview find the clean ace and will end this game 2-0. to zero. And they've shut down Vayne every fight. That last fight, Vayne got three autos off. And it was onto the Garen. Yeah, so, and the Garen's full health again. So, <laughs> you just, you just. Essentially did zero damage. They just can't protect the Vayne. Their composition can't do it. And they're just being shut down by Parkview's composition here. And now it looks like it's the end of the road. Yorg was the last remaining member of the Bastion of Colonial Forge. But he too has fallen just like their championship series. It will be a 2-0 win for Parkview. I am a little surprised by that. I thought I we were gonna too. go. I thought we were gonna go to game three here. It took a little bit longer. 31 minutes is, is one of our longer games, I think. For the most part, we've we've had pretty short games, but that that game was also back and forth, but Parkview felt way more in control of it than they did in game one. It felt like it was it kind felt of all like Parkview. a cleaned up version of game one where yeah, uh, there, there sure. was still that time where we were questioning it when Colonial, especially in the mid-game. Uh, was able to really find an advantage. And we thought with the scaling potential that they had, getting that advantage meant that they would be able to close it out. But, I mean, Parkview, two games in a row now, they have taken situations they had no business winning fights, and they've won them anyway. Yeah, th they've played such a clean game, especially after the 15-minute mark. Whereas, like, the early game was good, but it's really when they come into their own, it's like 15, 20 minute mark when lane phase starts to end and they start to play that like more team oriented style. Because individually they're really pretty solid players, pretty good, but where their strength really lies is that we are a team, we're gonna play together, we're gonna use our synergy together and that's how we're gonna beat teams. That's what they've really done the last two games because individually it wasn't like they were way better. It was just like our team coordination was on another level tonight, and that's really, I think, why they ended up winning here. I mean, Parkview High, like, that was just a really good series from them. After stumbling in game one, they recovered, and then one of the few times they've seen a team come from behind with multiple thousands of gold down and actually come back and win a game so far. We can't take any credit away from Colonial Forge, though. Making it all the way to the finals is a feat in its own right. You can see the bracket here. It is going to be the Parkview section going to be taking the championship here, but I mean, Colonial Forge put up one hell of a fight. Both games having scenarios where we, we were almost sold on them just winning the game flat out. It was really some incredible comebacks from Parkview. And this was, I can definitively say, the best series that we have seen so far, at least the most competitive one to date. For sure, the be most competitive one. Both these teams played fantastically, I think. Um, it just was a slight edge here. Unfortunately, you get to see a game three because I think that would have been just oh, as good as the first two. They, they were really both quite good here. And unfortunately, like Colonial Forge, they found the leads, but they weren't able to quite capitalize on them. They weren't quite able to like, convert them into a, a game-defining victory here. And that's where I think that the, the, one of the strengths of Parkview was that like they just didn't give up. They didn't let things that went badly affect them too much. And they also didn't like say just give up too much. Every time, like you said, 
something bad happens or something goes wrong once the map or a play is made, they capitalize somewhere else. They get yeah. so, Sometimes it's a small thing, but sometimes it's a big thing, like those dragons that added up they in game one. They always lost the minimal amount. 100%. And then they got something back, and it was just like, well, that advantage that felt like should have been game ending just never really turned out to be. All right. Well, thank you to everybody for tuning in to today's broadcast. It was a very wonderful experience of both Rocket League and League of Legends. I have been your host in play-by-play -play audio adrenaline. Joining me is Kios. We will be back tomorrow for some more Rocket League and more League of Legends, so make sure if you want to follow the stream, stay tuned. Don't miss any of that. Once again, thank you to Play Versus for putting this all on for us. We're going to be saying goodnight, though, on the broadcast desk. We'll see you tomorrow. I was always told growing up, it's going to rot your brains. It's a waste of time. And then, like, now I see where eSports is at. And my family and I at home, we watch the League of Legends championship. One of the students here at BC, he came to me and said, hey, we're really interested in starting an eSports team. Like, BC needs an eSports team. And can you help us? I was a little bit apprehensive because I did not play video games and I wasn't sure what it would all entail. But then that same student came to my door almost every day the first week of school and said, have you talked to the principal? What's going on with the eSports team? It's really because of the students. They were the ones that I felt like, because they're so interested, I think I can do this. My team, they never played League of Legends before, and them going from starting out just at the basic beginnings to now they're in the 30s and seeing how their team works, they're strategizing, and they've basically taken ownership of our team and run with it. It's been fantastic. At our school, leadership is really encouraged and admired among the students. With eSports, uh, my students get an opportunity in a different way than what maybe traditionally would be thought of as this is a leadership role you would have. So we have a team captain, we also have a team coach, and they really work really well with the students to kind of bring them together. And they are the ones that outside of school, they're practicing. We get three hours of practice a day. They come in at 7 a.m. in the morning, and they're, they're waiting for me. They're like, hey, can, we're ready to go. Can we come in? Can we practice? Originally, we were practicing three days a week, and they were like concerned they weren't getting enough practice. They were like, can we do more? Can we squeeze in another day? So they wanted to do five days a week, but I was like, um, let's start with three. Let's build up to four, and if we make it to playoffs, then we'll go to five. They are just so motivated to kind of like take ownership of it. They basically decide beforehand what their bands are, who's doing what position, because I really would not have that kind of knowledge. And even though I don't play as much as they do, you know, you have to admire somebody who's built up their skill set. They've had to put in a lot of time and energy in order to be so good. And then when I play, I go like, wow, this is a lot harder than it looks. It has been wonderful watching how good my students have gotten in such a short amount of time. <laughs>